and then um, Jay, why don't you call us to order and then we can figure out who will take over. I will. Uh, this is Jay Rosepepe, a city council member uh, for today's land use committee meeting of February 16th, 2022. And I'll ask the other council members to introduce themselves first and then the other participants. I'm Fred Chang, also a council member. Scott Diener, council member. And also with us is Nick Vaughn, Jim Fisk, Josie Radham. How do you pronounce it? Rademacher. Rademacher. Okay. Yeah. And Brandy Wallace. Uh, before we start the agenda, the first piece of business is we need a new chair. Uh, so are there any nominations? I nominate Scott. And I will nominate Fred. <laughs> so, um, Fred, are you, you're... Who's chair of the, sorry, I should remember this, but who's chair of the right of way or the, sorry, the transportation committee? I'm chairing transportation. So I'm, I'm. I'm oh, so you like being chair. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but aren't you double booked tonight, Fred? Or what? Trans oh, no, it's not transportation, it's utilities. Utilities, right. Back to back yeah. tonight. Oh. Yeah, the utilities committee that I'm not on. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm fine being chair. All right, uh, Scott, you're chair. Uh, therefore, you can take the meeting. Okay. Uh, thank you, I guess. So um, the first item is the comprehensive plan docket. Uh, it looks like we've talked about a couple of these agenda items. So I, I presume these are just kind of any, any details or updates. Yeah, we, we have. And I'm hoping we can actually rearrange a couple of these items with Brandy here. And I know that I, I believe I saw that Bob Showers is in the um, attendees list. Do we want to tackle that item first so that Brandy can get going? I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm good. So, Are you ready to go? I am. All right. And um, Josie, can you also try to bring um, uh, Bob Showers and Jacob Miller into the meeting um, to participate? I just promoted them both to panelists, so it should work for them. All right, Brandy. Okay, so yep, I see them in here. So um, Mr. Showers presented a proposal to the mayor asking uh, the committee to consider or ultimately the council to consider renaming the T-ball field um, behind the active club. Uh, there has been a member of the South Kitsap Western Little League um, who was a past president passed away recently and they want to honor him and what he's done for the community uh, by naming that ball field after him. Um, their board did take a um, vote and attached to this packet was the minutes authorizing um, the city to consider uh, renaming the field. So. Um, that is the ask is to see if the committee has a recommendation to bring before the council in renaming the field. And then again, uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Showers are both in the audience if they have, um, if you guys have any additional questions. Okay, and um, I just want to clarify, I didn't have an attachment to the packet, um, but I also went online to the packet and it's just the agenda. Was there more that was actually sent to the council? Yes, I believe an email was sent um, either late last week or on Monday. Okay. The, the, the packet, all the uh, backup for it went out Monday. So you should have received that via email. Okay. Um, just know that it's not online at the, at the public site. All right, I will find that in the meantime. Go ahead and uh, Mr. Showers or Mr. Miller. Uh, and, and for the record, Jacob Miller is our new associate planner. I was going to actually introduce him oh, at some oh. point during this meeting. Um, Jacob, I don't know if you wanna show your face to everyone, but um, this is the land use committee meeting and uh, three council members, the mayor, and then Brandy is our our city clerk, but I know Jacob was having trouble with his camera earlier, so there he is. 
Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. This this is the uh, gentleman from is it Montana? That's, That's correct. correct. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Welcome to Port Orchard. Thank you. Much appreciated. Okay. Then I'll just for the record, it's uh, Mr. Showers and Mr. Martin is the one that presented <laughs> to, okay. to this committee to change the um, the name. And Mr. Showers is on the line, and I believe he's unmuted, so he can speak if you would like for him to. I think you're still muted, Mr. Showers. I see the mute button going off and on. So you are still muted at this time if you want to unmute. And if you're on your, oh, there you go. So you are un, whoop, well, it's back to muted again. There you go. Well. Maybe not, it keeps going back and forth. But I think if you can, you can hit star nine, I think if you're on the phone and then unmute too. Looks like he's having some issues getting his audio. Is there any questions from the committee that they want to ask him and he can think about that? Or what's your thoughts on uh, moving this forward to the council? Um, I, I don't have any questions for the for, for Bob or or for the, the request. Uh, my question is more one of, I guess, hist history, like what happened when we named one for Art Michelson? Does this involve signage? Uh, does this involve a duration of the period? Um, it's interesting that a lot of um, facilities are considering naming rights and they often have a duration. You know, we just assume that we name something it's in perpetuity. Um, that may not happen actually. I, I understand that that's actually changing. Um, so Fred, we, we wouldn't be doing any signage, but the Little League would. So it's nothing we would be doing. This is their request. They're likely going to put up a sign. Uh, you know, it, it's the field, the, the Art Michelson field. This is the field on the back side of that is the T-ball field, I believe, or it could be the one that's on Sydney Glen, which, which one, I'm not completely positive. There's a, there's a, the minor league field is off across from Sydney Glen and there's, there's a T-ball field next to it and there's a t-ball field behind uh the art michelson field so it's one of those two fields that they're renaming uh for this purpose but we wouldn't be providing any signage and i really think it's up to the little league how long they want they wanted to 20 years from now rename it for somebody else you know they're the ones operating the field i don't and I'm going to try and pull up a map. I think I have a map of the ball field, so that way we can at least identify which which section of the field he wishes to rename. Um, and then, um, Josie, I think you have the ability as being the host to unmute Mr. Showers. So maybe you can unmute him, and then maybe he can start talking and see if that works better while I'm pulling up the map. There you are, Bob, you're unmuted. Looks like he's having problems with the microphone. I don't think it's an issue of being muted. Okay. Just for record, I don't have any problem bringing this before the council. I think it's a great idea. It's one of two fields. Hey, hey um, Bob, I, if you can hear us, um, you can dial in, there's a phone number that you can call and it's, 
I think and, we're going to be done with this before Bob. Okay. Call in. I, 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 I'm not hearing any issues with this. Right. And we can, we can figure out which field it is when it gets to the city council meeting. It sounds like the city's involvement is also minimal. It's not like we have to rename any maps or anything like that. Yeah. Um, it's not like we're renaming a park or something. Right. Okay. Yeah. Correct. All right. <laughs> Um, Bob, if you can hear us, all is good, uh, and uh, staff will reach out to you. So uh, moving on to the next agenda item, did you want to go back to the top, or is there any uh, that, Rob, you want to hit first before? Are you going to another meeting? Uh, I'm going to hang out at this meeting. Okay. Uh, do you want to start back at the top, Nick, or what's your preference? Yeah, yeah let's go through the from top to bottom. Um, the first item, obviously, that was on the work study agenda last night, and I threw it on this agenda in case there was any follow up discussion that was needed. But I think we pretty well have that squared away. So I don't know that we need to revisit it. What, what, it, what is that subject matter? It's oh. the comprehensive plan docket. So that yeah, was the okay. docket that we discussed last night, which will then go to council for approval. Um, Jim, I can't remember if we were aiming for March um, 8th or whether that'll happen next week. I think uh, it was the first week in March. Yeah, so I think March 8th, the docket will be on the city council business agenda um, for approval. And I'm good. I don't have any issues. I, I'm good. I, I feel like I um, am in, well informed on the issue. All right. So, so the next item also we talked about a little bit last night. I don't know. Are you looking at a little more detailed explanation of the projections? Well, th this is a different item than what we talked about last night. Um, we did discuss this at the Economic Development Committee on Monday, and I thought this was an important issue to talk about with economic development and land use both um, for, for different reasons. Um, what I've put together here, and I'm, I'm sharing my screen right now, you should be able to see a spreadsheet. Um, I have taken all of our housing that is, that is in for permitting now and um, using the Office of Financial Management population estimating schedule, which is an April 1 through March 31st annual um, update that they do, I have, I have projected what units are going to be receiving certificates of occupancy in which uh, period for the next four years, trying to estimate what, what population we're going to be dealing with because we are seeing a surge in permitting activity. And so um, I went through all of our, our permits and, and there's several permits or several projects that are under construction. There are single family uh, permits that are uh, ready to issue. And so we have pretty good certainty about when things are happening, especially in the near term. Um, once you get uh, about three to four years out, it starts becoming a little bit cloudier. And um, I took just basic unit counts and then the unit type and I took OFMs uh, persons per household number, and I extrapolated what our total population growth is expected to be when the when the April 1st, um, 2022 population comes out, when the 2023 population comes out, and so on. And so the green lines on the spreadsheet correspond to a total population growth number. Um, the A couple of, of rows below that is the total number of housing units being added to the city. And um, at the bottom of this spreadsheet, I actually have a table of a whole bunch of projects that I'm not quite sure when they're actually going to be ready for occupancy, but they're likely to be added to one of these uh, four years, or at least most of them are likely to be added. So when you look at uh, our, our, the number that we should be getting in a couple of months, I'm expecting to see about a 573 person increase in the city. And then for next year, we have enough units um, if you, if you go through these projects, the Haven Apartments is, is vertical right now on construction. They should be seeing occupancy um, later this year and into early next year. Um, McCormick West Division 11, the final plat's going to the City Council uh, next week. Amherst Plat is already recorded um, and they're building houses. Stetson Heights already recorded in building houses. The first of the Salmonberry Townhome buildings is, is uh, vertical. Um, the Geiger Plat is likely to be recorded later this year with home building commencing um, in time to get occupancy by the end of the year. And then the Magnolia Ridge subdivision, they've, they've got 50 permits in for review right now and they've, they've pulled the first 12. Um, so when you take all of these, that, that adds up to about 1200 people during the next OFM population estimating uh, period. Um, 
in 2023 through 2024, um, it's another 1,700 people. And in the following year, um, we're pretty certain about another 1,500 people, which uh, all said and done in that, in that three and a half year period is about 5,200 new residents coming to the city in a relatively short period of time. By comparison, in uh, over the last five or six years, we our, our highest uh, year over year growth was about 490 people. And our, our average is probably close to 360 or 370. So you can see that the, the uh, rate of growth and the cumulative growth is going to be significantly higher in the next few years. Um, and I, I think this is useful information as you head into your council retreat and as we start talking about budget issues in, uh, in, in uh, this coming summer. I, I mentioned too, there's this other pipeline growth table here. And, and Council Member Chang, I know that you saw this at economic development. We did realize that one project came in in the last two weeks that wasn't on here. There's a Blueberry Apartments uh, project that applied for an LDAP um, to start uh, doing their civil site work. So 108 additional apartments have been added to the list. And um, <clears throat> the total of all of these projects, which all of the McCormick projects, they're projecting to build all of these in the next six years, barring an economic slowdown, uh, which I'm sure is going to come. So I don't think that all of the McCormick stuff will actually happen. So parcels F through M and then McCormick West division 16 through 23 are, you know, I, I would think about half of those are probably going to happen in the next uh, four or five years. Um, but this is another 6,300 people. And so um, this, this rolls into the population allocation discussion that's next on the agenda, which is the regional growth target setting. And as you can see from this list, we already have active projects um, that, are, that are going to bring in uh, about 11,500 people into the city. And even if, this, even if the real estate market can't absorb this number of units in the amount of time that people think they're gonna build these units, um, it's, it's only a matter of time before these units will, will come forward and uh, be occupied. And um, at the rate things are going, we, we are going to see a very different Port Orchard in a pretty short period of time. So Fred, is there anything I missed from, from Monday that economic development uh, or that I, I shared with economic development or was that the same presentation? No, that's a good presentation. I like the location column. Um, I guess the only follow-up question I had is on your other pipeline growth, um, is there any estimate of, is it gonna be within the 2025 timeframe? We're just not sure like which year it's gonna be, or do you think it's after that? I think some of these projects, like the Polisco Apartments, Bob Disney has called me and he's called the mayor because he, you know, he wants his permits. I think this is going to be done probably uh, in about 15 to 18 months um, and occupied, but it could slide into the subsequent period and the permits haven't been pulled yet. So um, one, these are things that I'm not, just not quite as certain about. Um, 429 Bay Street, those permits are ready to issue. They've even paid their connection fees, but they're waiting on an agreement with the Gull uh, Fuel Company to do some cleanup of contaminated soil on the site. And so um, they, they've asked for an extension now twice, and now they're extending it until July on when they're going to be starting construction. And so, you know, they, ha they have everything in order. I believe that they intend to go forward, but we keep they keep stalling a little bit. And so I, I haven't moved that into a particular column yet. So that's the lighthouse project? That is the lighthouse, uh, Cheers, Lighthouse, Tweetons. Okay. And this is the first I've heard of, of how extensive the uh, contamination was. What can you characterize that? Was it pretty substantive or was it moderate or? Any, anybody um, that grew up here knows that that was Binger's gas station. Gas station, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know the extent of the contamination. My understanding in talking to the attorney who is representing the current owner is that they're just negotiating um, a contract that will figure out who's paying for what as part of this cleanup. And so they're, oh, okay. they're just trying to assign responsibility and, um, and get that cleanup initiated. See Jay's hand raised. I mean, he's muted. Yeah, he's never done Zoom before. Yeah, like that never happens. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a outstanding spreadsheet, Nick. Uh, I'd ask that you could for, uh, email it to me um, and the other council members. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask, so when you said that uh, the, I'll say Lighthouse Tweetons Project 429 
You said they hadn't paid their connection fees. They have. They they, they paid have. them that's right before they okay. changed. I'm sorry. Yeah, that that's what that's what I thought. Yeah, this is really really good. Uh, we are growing. All right. Um, any other discussion on this? Yeah, if it, Nick, it might be good to, just to send to all council members as well. Yes, sure. absolutely. All right. Okay. Are you going to talk about population allocations at all anymore? Next, we know that's next on the agenda. Okay, and if you be, would you be, are you prepared to talk about your conversation with Eric Baker today and then that annexation map maybe? I yeah, am, I was yes. curious how that conversation went. So, um, yeah, so last night at the city council meeting, we talked about this growth target dashboard. Um, I've continued playing with the numbers and I've even started inserting numbers for the other uh, regional geographies. But the high capacity transit communities of which Port Orchard is uh, a member of that group of, of um, geographic areas, I think it's coming into more focus. Um, I've now had conversations offline with Paulsbo, and then today I met with Eric Baker, who was also talking to Paulsbo. And um, what Eric believes that we can do is he thinks that there is some wiggle room in the PSRC assigned number for this 24,368. We have come up with a proposal that would, would over allocate um, under that geography by a little less than 2,000 people and would potentially take away from either uh, the core cities or um, the metro cities, depending on what happens with, with Bremerton or, um, or Silverdale. Um, even if we had to still reduce things further by 2000, I think between Port Orchard, Kingston, the Port Orchard UGA, we could, we could divvy up a reduction of 2000 in, in, in population allocation and get to the PSRC adopted population target. Um, so I was happy to see that that um, Eric Baker indicated the county was supportive of our request to have a higher number than what we talked about last night. Um, under the scenario that he is now talking to Paulsbo about, we are at 11,500 for the city of Port Orchard and 3,552 for the Port Orchard UGA, which matches exactly the buildable lands capacity of our urban growth area. So nice. what Eric and I discussed was that... Um, the, the Port Orchard urban, what's that? There's this feedback from you, from you, I think. Okay, so um, the Port Orchard urban growth area has land capacity of 3,552 as of the, the 2020 buildable lands report, and they're asking for that matching allocation. <laughs> but the county is also currently underperforming in terms of their rate of growth relative to the target. And so they believe they're going to have to take measures to actually upzone portions of the Port Orchard UGA to, to achieve higher um, net density out of development in that area. But at the same time, they're also open to redesignating some areas of our urban growth area from residential to commercial so that it supports a higher employment target. Um, and so they'll be reducing their land capacity by converting land from commercial to residential, but they'll be increasing it because they have to take reasonable, reasonable measures to um, increase the productivity of lands in our urban growth boundary. So they were comfortable sort of matching their existing population capacity with their growth target um, with the understanding that there's going to be some, some adjustments um, made in the urban growth area that sort of cancel each other out. Um, Eric also talked to Paulsbo and believes that Paulsbo is further reducing their ask. Um, he, he was explaining that they are more and more concerned about their sewer capacity and their ability to actually take growth due to sewer limitations. And so um, they are now requesting a total allocation of 4,000 between their urban growth area and their city. So um, with the Paulsbo reduction, um, Port Orchard goes up a little bit. We've currently got Bainbridge Island at 3,800. And Eric is kind of shares my opinion that if Bainbridge doesn't give us a, a proposal sometime in the next 30 days, we're going to have to tell them um, a number and, and then it's going to be up to them to, to make a counter proposal before we take action. So um, it's, it's possible that we will have to give a little bit or take a little bit, um, depending on what uh, Bainbridge Island decides. So I'm, I'm feeling like we're getting a lot closer. 
Um, we have our next meeting with uh, the county and the three high capacity transit communities next week. And I'm hopeful that we will have uh, a recommendation coming out of that meeting that includes a proposed target for Bainbridge Island that is sort of subject to Bainbridge Island discussing that. And it's possible that after Bainbridge Island gets a number, they may have to come back with um, a counter proposal that we will have to accommodate. So my question for about Paul's bow, and, and you may not be able to answer this, at least right now, is what are they doing to plan for future growth? Because sitting on current infrastructure is, is not assisting our region whatsoever. Well, um, their, my understanding is that their sewer facility is a, is a utility district. It's not city owned. Is that, am I correct on that? That's I don't know the UD, I believe. That, that was my understanding. So I, I think there are things that have to happen with KPUD and there are also NPDES uh, permitting issues that have to be resolved in terms of what is coming out of that plant. And so I don't, I don't know that they know the full scope of what is needed uh, in terms of sewer to support growth. And, and, you know, Nick, I know we had the discussion last night, you know, about we can't really correct me if I'm wrong, dictate what other people's numbers are. We can only look at kind of our own, but um, this doesn't look like it's, you know, when I look at that, you know, going as we move toward 2050, that we're, you know, that it's out of our, that that may not happen. You know I mean? It, it's, it looks like our growth is, is, is tracking pretty well toward that. What am I missing? Well, yeah, I, I think that Port Orchard, Remember that we update our comprehensive plan every eight years under the current uh, GMA framework. So in right. eight years, we go through this exercise again, and it is likely that um, that the vision twenty fifth, the vision twenty sixty document will have slightly different numbers, and we will be um, sort of steered into new directions based on the regional growth strategy. So I, I think the main thing we have to worry about is that our our twenty year target does not get get exceeded in the the eight years between this plan and the next plan, because we will have time to correct course um, moving forward thereafter. And it's likely in the next cycle, we won't be one of these high capacity, we won't be in this group with this group of cities. We're going to be up with Silverdale. Right. I, unless the threshold for a core city, which the current threshold is a population of 25,000, unless PSRC increases that you know, commensurate with the rate of growth throughout the region, um, I think we'll be in that same category as Silverdale and we will be splitting uh, a larger share of growth between the two areas and even Bainbridge Island could end up in that category as well because they're right at the threshold today. Hmm. All right, well, you know, I know it's a political issue. Um, I just wish that um, Bainbridge and Paulsbo understand that they've, they've got to They've got to do a better job of, of planning for growth. Um, Paulsbo, in the years I've been here, so since 05, essentially, they've not changed their uh, urban growth area boundary, um, as far as I know. Uh, it looks pretty much similar to what's been around forever. They, the they've annexed most of, most of it. What they haven't done is upzoned. Yeah, yeah. Reasonable measures haven't really been in play there either. Uh, and then Bainbridge Island has, has got this no growth approach as a city. It just doesn't track. Yeah, the, you know, the one thing that was shared, um, I believe that was at our plan, Paul meeting mayor, was that um, Bainbridge Island, the, the newly elected members who are now serving on, on plan, Paul, did indicate that there has been a major shift among the population on the island in terms of doing things about especially affordable housing and things at the lower end of the scale, I think there's a recognition that they have a major problem in that they don't have people, uh, they have jobs on the island that people can't afford to live near. So, so they said there has been some political shift. Um, Nick, they, of, they talk a good game and they always have, <laughs> but yeah. their actions don't support their words. Yeah, I, I concur totally. Yeah. And, well, and we all know that that is a matter of not if you're in the barrel, but just when. So it's 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 got its issues. Yeah. They they do have more turnover on their council, so that's that's both good and bad, I guess. You know, no, you know, they 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 eat, eat each other up over there. And, I, and last election, a couple of them were sleeping together. Yeah, I don't think they're on council anymore. They're not. So yeah, it's um, yeah. 
so they have at least two new members. Um, and a couple of them we I encountered through the Realtors Association, and they certainly, as, as you said, Rob, they certainly talked a good game, game about wanting to have more housing on the island. So we'll just see if, you know, if they have the numbers to, yeah. to bring that forward. All right. All right. So the, the, the plan then is to bring this back to the council with these tweaks, as I understand. Well, yeah, I, I think we'll just report back periodically with the progress in, in negotiating numbers. And I suspect by um, the end of next week, we will have a proposal to recommend to KRC, the KRCC board, and then the board will be discussing it. And I think the mayor is going to have to relay how those conversations are progressing. So Nick's group has one more meeting. Then the, the, the plan Paul group has a meeting based on their recommendation and hopefully Baybridge Island is playing. Well, if that all goes as planned, then the full board that Jay and I both hold a seat on would then be ratifying whatever recommendation comes from the plan Paul group. Well, I'll just weigh in and say that when we uh, did that tabletop exercise a couple of years ago, that uh, Nick, you were a major participant, uh, it was interesting to see that there weren't a lot of Legos down at the uh, Bainbridge Island site, and I'll leave it at that. So, yeah. Nick, Nick, do you want to talk about the annexation oh, right. map? Could you throw that yeah. up? So the other part of the conversation that I had with Eric Baker today, which potentially helps with this um, uh, growth planning discussion, um, we had floated an, an idea to the county about six months ago about the possibility of using a new tool the legislature has provided for annexation. And so we identified um, seven planning areas on a map that we would potentially be interested in annexing uh, a few or all of. And I believe we discussed this at the land use committee uh, mm -hmm. in October as well. Yes. Um, in any event, after talking to Eric today, um, his take was yes, this would actually go a long way towards helping the county especially if they end up getting appealed by either a um, pro development group or, or another group that thinks they have too much urban growth area. And so um, Eric said that, that if we're going to do this, it has to be done relatively quickly because we don't wanna have to adjust the targets after they've been set to recognize the annexation. Essentially the annexation needs to be well on its way to approval by the time that the KRCC board adopts these targets. So, um, I have, I've, I, Jim and I both have been looking at the regulations for a interlocal agreement type of annexation. And, you know, in terms of the minimum requirements, it's relatively straightforward. We have to give notice to the fire district. We have to notify West Sound Utility District. Um, and then we, we're supposed to draft the agreement and make it available to the public before we send out a public notice so that the public can actually go read what's in the agreement. They can see the boundaries, they can see the proposed zoning. Um, my understanding in talking to the county was they may want an additional public process on the front end of that to determine what this map should look like. And so how quickly and easily this can be done really depends on whether we are trying to create an annexation proposal through a public process before starting the official annexation process, or whether we're going to go forward with the map that you see and just run it through the, the standard uh, procedure that's outlined in state law. So I've asked him to clarify what, what it is that the county wants because he, he made it seem earlier in our discussions like um, he, he wanted to make sure that we managed this well from a PR and public relations standpoint. And I agree with that sentiment that we need to conduct outreach. Um, and the conversation Nick and I had earlier today, county staff nor our staff has the bandwidth to manage this. And we should look for a consultant to do this body of work so that we do it right and, and don't stumble along the way. So what's the time frame to have this uh, done? Yeah. By? Because I believe Correct me if I'm wrong. You know, we we had a partial discussion about this at the uh, at one of our council meetings, or at least previous land use, and and there was some you know uh, favoritism toward doing this, but the outreach was the the real concern. Uh, I I think that the timeline on this um, 
could, I think we could be wrapped up with this sometime during the summer. And I think we could be far along, far enough along with it by May so that we're setting population targets under the assumption that the annexation is completed. But um, I don't know, I think the county and the city would need to talk a little bit more about whether are, are we using this map as the starting point and only reaching out to the people in these areas or are we having a broader conversation about potentially annexing more than this in which we, case, we no right. this is this is a big bite for us <laughs> right that's that's kind of my thought as well and i i think that level of outreach could be done relatively easily with um, mailed notices and potentially an, an opportunity to go online and say, you know, where do you live and do you support this or not? And we can plot on a map wh where there is broad support for annexation, where there's broad opposition, and we could consider amending uh, if, if the purple area, if nobody wants to come into the city, we could amend the proposal and, and not include that area. But if there's broad support everywhere else, we could proceed. Um, I'm, I'm still brainstorming, brainstorming about how to structure this sort of outreach if it's if it's outside of the the required process and, and on the front end end of the process um, it'd be simply our our communications consultant helping you that, guys that's what i was thinking as well I'm, I'm not even sure that we need a planning consultant we may be able to do it with just um the the contract that we've already signed i'm in favor of bringing this to council uh and moving forward on this um Nick, are we talking about all the colored annexation areas? For some reason, I was thinking we're only doing the Southwest Bethel and Southeast Bethel, but we're talking well, about all above that as well. At, at this time we are. And I think that okay. the, the county's position has always been, they want a balanced annexation. They don't want us taking all the commercial without taking some of the residential. I, yeah. I think that's a fair position to take. Yeah. Most of the residential is in that purple area. Um, the Bethel South Corridor has some has kind of a mix. The the teal or aqua color on Mile Hill is a little bit more commercial, and the other areas are really low. There's not a ton of people in them or jobs. It's it's just cleaning up the last of our UGA that are little pockets of county that are surrounded by the city in those areas. And and um, it's possible that this could be tailored uh, trimmed back to not include either the aqua or the purple. And to just clean up those areas on the west side of the city and then get the Bethel South Corridor in, I don't think the county would be opposed to to that approach either. But we'd have to we'd have to work it out with them. Well, I'll just weigh in on public process. I support public process, but um, sometimes you have a uh, a an approach by the county that that. Um, puts a lot of emphasis on public process. And, and sometimes, in my opinion, maybe more than what is really needed for the issue at hand. So, um, you know, I, I would support a reasonable amount of public process, but, um, you know, we don't need to kill this one. And then my next question is looking at the Southeast Bethel and the Brown, why the jog is, is that? That's Nick's dream and it's not gonna fly. He's, well, he's, he's taking out a mobile home park. The uh, taking out is the wrong word. The, um, <laughs> the boundary of that mobile home park, it's either going to be very irregular by sticking way out further to the east than everything else we'd be taking in, or it's going to be irregular by being concave. So the shape of that particular pros property was such that it was going to create an irregular boundary regardless. Okay. And my preference would be to not take it solely because the ongoing um, inspection and responsibilities associated with the manufactured home park are, are pretty significant. And it's, it's my preference not to add another one to the city that our building department is going to be tracking um, when the county is probably already familiar with it. And, um, but we, could, we can draw the line either way. It's possible that if, if we take the mobile home park in that the entire boundary shifts a little bit further to the east over to Converse to make things more regular. Now, is that mobile home or is it manufactured home? I think it's a mix. Okay. It's, it's travel trailers and mobile homes. Travel trailers. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right. All right. Um, so, Nick, your, your final staff recommendation on this? Uh, on the annexation? 
Yeah. I, I think we continue exploring it. And once I hear from the county what they have in mind for public process, I'm going to put together a proposal that okay. can be discussed with the whole council and we can potentially start doing some outreach based on this existing map. But I need to hear from the county uh, if that's going to work for them. Okay. All right. Is any other comments on that agenda item? No, again, I'm good. Okay. Fred, I presume you're good too. Yeah, I, I support. Okay. It. All right. Uh, the next agenda item is the Crown Castle cell tower. Yes. So the final item, um, the city currently has a lease with Crown Castle for a cell phone tower that's located at the 390 zone reservoir on the city property by the industrial park. Um, that lease has one five-year extension remaining plus uh, the end of the current five-year period. So I think it's, it's a total of five and a half or six and a half years at this point. Um, I'm going to share my screen and show you where this is at, if you're not familiar. Um, in any event, the, the leasing company has indicated that um, they don't have a backup generator for this cell phone tower. And so when there's a power outage, the um, cell phone tower ceases to work. And so this is an emergency management issue, but it's also just providing uh, service to people in the area who, who rely on, uh, on a cell phone. Um, the, uh, you can see the, the entrance to the old uh, dump off of Lloyd Parkway. There's a road that winds up past the shooting range that the police use up to the reservoir. Um, there's two cell phone towers up here. We're talking about the northernmost of the two. You can see there's a shadow uh, from one of these towers uh, on the southern property line, and then there's a second shadow um, mm -hmm. up to the northeast of the reservoir. We are talking about this northeast area. Um, this Crown Castle has asked for it to expand their enclosure um, to the west with a, I think it's about a 20 by 15 expansion of the, the area that they currently lease. Um, they've given us a, a rough framework in terms of what they're thinking in terms of compensation and term. They would be seeking a long-term extension of this contract, I think, in the vicinity of, of 30 or 40 years, but it would be in five-year chunks where they can they have automatic renewals of five years every five years. Um, we've talked about this. I brought this to economic development on Monday just to um, get a few more eyes on it before uh, we turn the city attorney loose on, on negotiating a new agreement. We obviously will look at uh, compensation and make sure that we are being compensated on par with what other, other towers pay in the area. And we've already started doing some of that research. Um, and if, if, if the land use committee is good with it, the economic uh, development committee didn't have a problem with it, we will proceed and likely bring a draft contract to the city council at um, a future date. I'm good with it. I think that's an, an important uh, addition that they want to make for emergency power. The, oh. the other piece of this that I forgot to mention, they do want to include in the lease the ability to add an additional carrier to their tower. And so um, they, I think they wanted to be able to do that without paying additional compensation to the city. Um, our attorney has suggested that we may want to include a provision that if they are able to bring another carry on, carrier on, that the lease rate would change. So that's part of what our attorney is going to look into for us and, and provide as a counter proposal to Crown Castle. So um, I imagine there'll be some back and forth on this. And once we get close to an agreement, we will have something to share. Uh, Nick, yeah, I concur no. with Scott, but I have a, when we're finished this, I got a tangential issue I want to ask about with cell towers. And so you know, the, if they, I was just going to say, we want them to have as many carriers as we can on this pole. Yeah. Otherwise we end up with more poles. Yeah. I think the co-locating is a good idea, but if they do add another carrier, is there any indication if they would have to go up from the current height of the existing tower? Will they expand it uh, vertically? Do we know? We have not been told. Okay. Yeah, there, there typically is some vertical separation that's required for carriers, um, but quite often they plan for that when they when they build the tower. Um, it's 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 interesting. I haven't uh, heard of it before, or at least maybe 
not aware of it, but uh, an additional lease rate if they have an additional carrier is interesting. All I'm right, just I, from the environmental impact, like how high does it go and is it going to impact any of the neighbors? And I assume it's not going to, but you know, how high would they want to go? I don't know. You know, yeah. I was just driving through Gig Harbor today and, you know, downtown Gig Harbor, I'm looking at the hillside across the way and there's a cell tower, two cell towers sticking up a hundred feet above the creek canopy. They've been there for ever, you know, and I just finally noticed them today, you know, they, they need to be above the tree canopy or yeah. they don't work. And Fred, I don't know that they typically go up once a tower is established. Usually they're, they're set in their height once, once they're established. I mean, that's been my experience with those. But Otherwise they got to rebuild it. Yeah. yeah. They would have to get it to add to the top of it. It was yeah. engineered, you know, right. A certain way. Yeah, they would ha have to get a conditional use permit to uh, enlarge it anyway. So tangentially. Right. Yeah. Uh, what do you got, Jay? Yeah, just, you know, this one came up a little a couple weeks ago about a tower up at um, Christ Rock Church. And, you know, basically what are our uh, code for, um, you know, I guess design would be the best way to state it. Uh, is this something that's uh, an issue right now? I have no, you know, I didn't have an issue because we don't really have anything. But again, on the workload list, is this something that's medium down at the bottom? We'll call you later. <laughs> we, we actually have a code that our attorney drafted for another client that she's provided to us. And so we're taking some proposed standards to the Planning Commission uh, this spring, and we'll hopefully have something uh, in the way of a recommendation in, in April or May. Super. Thank you very much. Um, and Nick, for what it's what it's worth, uh, the, the county went through a recent experience with uh, a contentious tower application, and there were some lessons learned there, uh, especially if we're talking about a stealth design. And I'd be happy to share those with you, including that decision. Sure, absolutely. Jim, would you mind actually, I mean, uh, Council Member Diener, are you interested in, in reviewing the code that's been shared with us? Would I mean, would it help to take a look at what's been provided and see if, if there's anything that you can flag for us? Sure, I, I'm happy to do that. Um, I, I um, also have a, a staff member who's, who's our cell tower expert, and he lives in the city, and he might be willing to take a look at it as well. Okay, great. He, he has lots of comments about cell towers in the city, so I'm sure he'll, he'll be happy to help. Okay, um, if there's nothing left on cell towers, then uh, Fred, you would ask that tiny home zoning uh, be a, a standing agenda item. I believe that's correct, the way I'm characterizing that. Do you wanna talk a little bit more ab about what you have in mind here and, and how we can move this uh, as an agenda item along? Sure, um, I was just interested in how our current zoning, especially even the latest, uh, I guess, changes from the legislature last year, would affect possible tiny zoning in the city limits. Um, so it's just sort of revisiting our new code. And I'm just curious, like, I believe we made it a conditional use in all the residential areas or in several of the residential areas. But, um, you know, what does that mean? Is it is it easier, for example, for a church to do it on their lot or for a private homeowner or property owner to do so and i just sure. want to get a better let's, understanding let's just so we're all clear this this is about um supportive housing uh, Permanent versus, supportive house. yeah. versus a tiny sfr being developed right so um council member chang i there there's a couple of issues at play here first of all the alleged or the state building code council amended the state building codes concerning tiny homes. And so there is now an appendix of the IRC or the IBC, I forget which one, that deals with tiny house design from a, a building codes pers perspective. So we now have that in place. Um, I think that in terms of a permanent supportive housing situation, the whether the tiny home is allowed per our zoning and design standards depends whether it's on wheels or whether it is on a foundation. Um, if a, if a 
organization wanted to do a supportive housing type development for tiny houses on wheels that are in a parking lot, that is a different uh, that is different from a design guideline perspective because those are treated as vehicles, not as structures. If you're trying to do a permanent tiny house cluster, you are going to have to fit within one of our uh, building types in our zoning code, which we do have a, a cottage cluster building type. And so presumably the cottage cluster could be used for tiny homes, though that standard was not developed specifically with tiny homes in mind so much as smaller houses. Um, so I, I think that, Jim, would you agree with that assessment? I mean, I think that the the tiny homes are going to be subject to the design standards for residential in our form-based code, but there's a path for them if they're on foundations. Yeah, I, I think so. I think our code would allow that sort of thing. Um, I think the big, bigger hurdle would be the building code and the you know the minimum size bedrooms, that sort of thing when you're talking about a dwelling unit. So. I and think the land use code, there, there's opportunity to do it, but, you know, the building code might present, present some challenges. And, and Fred, can I characterize what I think you mean by, by tiny home? We're, we're talking about essentially something that is uh, similar to a shed, but has uh, enough room for a bed or a bunk and um, no bathroom facilities or, or cooking facilities built into it. And... Um, you know, basically is, is sort of elemental in its construction. And, and if that's, is that Fred, what you're kind of talking about? Kind yeah, of what was, uh, what's been developed, uh, but not been put into place over the recent yeah, years? I, I was curious how that would be affected. Yes. Yeah. So with that model in mind, um, Nick and Jim, is that something that the, the IBC or the IRC supports in, or, or is that out of code? No, the, the IBC now supports tiny homes. I believe it's Appendix R that was adopted with the last update. Um, I, I have to go look at it because I, it's not something I've studied extensively, yeah. but there, there is a tiny home appendix to the building code that I think the State Building Code Council created. It wasn't provided by the International Code Council, but it was specifically to address the issue of permitting tiny homes. Okay. Because these are these are essentially you know not uh, insulated. They're not sheetrocked, as as I understand them, as they're they're constructed. Correct. Okay. And so Perfect. and that that's where I think the tiny homes on wheels or even um, you know travel trailers. If 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 a organization wanted to put together this use that the legislature has mandated that cities allow, which is the support of housing, I think they would be able to do that by bringing in those mobile type units as opposed to building uh, structures that are affixed to a, a slab. Yeah, I'd like to weigh in if I could. Uh, one is I think that, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, either Fred or Scott, that, you know, what we're really talking about is how do we help our homeless population? And I think that I'd, I'd really like to table this discussion until we have our, because uh, I know this would be one of the agenda items at our retreat, to see how we want to move, you know, forward uh, on this before we uh, task uh, Nick and his team with doing any additional work on this. Well, I, I don't know that there is a need. A need from it, it sounds like there is a path forward, right? And, and the path forward is who wants to step up and and engage in that project. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think we need to have this as a standing item. Is my point. Yeah. To your committee, but I agree with you. So it doesn't have to be a standing item. I'm just glad that we can discuss it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have a problem with it being a standing item. It's just not every meeting will there be an update necessarily. True. Yeah. I don't think there is any. There's a. There is what I what I heard was there is a path forward. I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, Councilmember Diener, that you somebody needs to want to do this, and we'll work with them because there is a there is a path to do this. If someone wanted to do it, I so this, recommending keeping them on wheels would be the the most efficient way to do this and not have to be bogged down by an, a, no, a number of other regulations. Nick, can you send that link to us? I can't. Unfortunately, it's too small on my screen to copy. <laughs> this um, 
this is actually a subscription that we have that you have to sign into to oh, view the building okay. code. There, yep. there is a read only version that I think is available to the public. I just don't, I don't know the web address to you, Jim. I'll, I'll, I'll search, I'll search for it okay. later. It's so it's appendix Q to the IRC, which is the, the Washington residential code. Um, and the state requires this piece to be adopted. I think as part of the last update, they, the state adopted this provision. So local jurisdictions cannot opt out of it now. Okay. Thank you. So, and there is an inter energy conservation code and it, it basically talks about air leakage and making sure that there's some amount of uh, insulation and that these things are, are relatively airtight. Which I'm not convinced the current tiny homes that were constructed would meet. Yeah, maybe True. not. True. No, they, they don't. Yeah. They're cute. Okay. All right, well, more to think about on that, uh, but but essentially um, somebody's gonna wanna have to, to step up, take a look at that, and then also meet code. And, you know, um, Jim just uh, sent me a, a message and was, uh, I would like to add one item to our agenda since um, Fred brought up the issue of, of tiny homes. We did apply for a grant from the Department of Commerce last week for a housing action plan. The state legislature provided funding for cities to go through and evaluate um, housing needs in the community by income level. And the, the work that they're funding essentially feeds into our 2024 comprehensive plan update. And it's it's one of these commerce grants where pretty much everybody who applies gets funded. And, and you know, there, I suppose there's a chance there'll be more applicants than there is funding, but this is their second go around because they couldn't give away all the money that uh, the first time around. So there's a chance we will get a housing action plan grant that will allow us to look at these things and will include recommendations for how to better uh, accommodate this sort of thing. And so tiny homes could be part of that um, as could other uh, affordable housing types. Did we apply previously for this grant? We didn't apply the first time around, but we also didn't know of all the, the legislative changes in house bill uh 1220 or senate bill 1220 i forget which one that passed and um includes a lot more mandates for uh planning housing not only by quantity but also by affordability level relative to different segments of your population and so the um the housing action plan is going to help uh break down housing needs in a way that we haven't been able to do pro previously okay excellent how big a grant is that? 75,000 is what we've requested. Um, I don't know if, if, there, if they have too many applications, they might give smaller awards or they might cut off certain applicants. I'm not sure how they will handle that. Um, but that's certainly enough to, to do the project uh, with a consultant. Yes, okay. If, if history holds true, Nick's gonna get us a $75,000 grant, grant for $150,000 worth of the work though. <laughs> It is a tough labor market, but I'm, I'm convinced we can find somebody to do this work within that, that budgeted amount. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there uh, anything else or any good of the order? No, appreciate it. I'm going to jump off and go to the utility meeting. Yep. See you guys later. All right. We'll yep. adjourn at 533. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest, of your, rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.